Robert Chisholm is a UK trained mechanical engineer. He trained in aircraft gas turbines with the Bristol Division of Rolls Royce and subsequently worked for a time as a performance development engineer on the Olympus 593 engine, four of which powered the Concorde Mach 2 airliner. Subsequently, and prior to arriving in Canada in 1982, he worked for several consulting engineering firms and other firms who employed mechanical engineers. Soon after, after arriving in Canada to work for SNC, he found himself out of a job. He has since branched out into database design, information systems, and computer programming. In addition, he has taken a serious interest in economic problems, and in particular, find out how to make the Canadian economy work properly for everyone. His other interests include flying sailplanes, hang gliding, skiing, among others. Please join me in welcoming Robert Chisholm. Oh, good evening. Can you hear me, Kyle? And hear you just fine, yep. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk about some of the things that my wife and I saw during our visit to Washington, D.C. between March the 27th and April the 5th this year, 2023. With almost 350 pictures to choose from, I had the impossible task of trying to select the ones that I thought would most interest everybody. I have had to do the next best thing, which was to select some of the ones which I and my wife found to be the most interesting and adequately introduce them all in an hour. The Smithsonian Air and Space Museum is actually spread over two widely separated locations. One of them being the Washington DC Mall area, which is close to downtown Washington DC. The second location known as the Udva Hazy Center is at Dulles International Airport, which has a very large purpose-built hangar housing all the exhibits, almost all of them being aircraft from the largest, such as Concorde, to the very smallest sporting aircraft. You name it, this museum has it. Might be a good way to summarize it all. Civil and military aircraft, sailplanes, hang gliders, powered sporting aircraft, spacecraft, military weapons flying within the atmosphere or outside it, and so on. The Udva Hazy Center is easily reached via the Washington DC Metro system to the Innovent Innovation Center station on the Silver Line from where there is a bus leaving every hour, which drops you at the main entrance of the Udva Hazy Center. I'm going to start with the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in the Washington DC Mall area. This in my view is the more interesting one regarding the early days of aviation starting around the time of the Wright brothers. Though there are also some interesting things at the Udva Hazy Center concerning early balloon flights carrying mail or passengers before the Wright brothers world first controlled powered flight in their flyer controlled by the pilot strapped into it. Slide one. There are 60 slides all told in this. At the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in the Washington DC Mall area, the first thing you see when you walk in the main entrance is a light plane designed and built by a black man, Neil Loving. Slide two. It had folding wings, which enabled him to tow it by car to his local airport. And it had room for one passenger in the front cockpit. Here you see it on Neil Loving's driveway at home with the port wing folded back against the fuselage. Between 1968 and 1991, he flew almost 697 hours in it. In 1944, he lost both legs in a glider crash, but went on to demonstrate to everybody how perseverance in the face of near impossible odds can mean that you can achieve your dream, particularly in the case of black people who even now routinely encounter severe discrimination founded on baseless social prejudices. Neil Loving was also the first black man to both earn his pilot's license and to have a double amputation after his 1944 glider accident. Moving to slide three now. From this point on, I'm going to focus for a while 
on the early history of flight and some of the early experimenters who had varying degrees of success. Otto Lilienthal was described by the Wright brothers as, quote, easily the most important of all the men in the 19th century who attacked the flying problem. What you see here is a replica of one of his hang gliders, which he controlled in flight simply by shifting his weight relative to the glider structure, just like most hang gliders today. He died on August 10th, 1896, after crashing in his glider the previous day, which broke his neck. The glider had stalled at about 50 feet and he could not regain control. He made many of his flights off an artificial hill near Berlin, and some of these flights were as long as 250 meters. By the time of his death, he had made over 2,000 flights. Going to slide four now. Well, who has not heard of the Wright brothers and their flyer, which made the world's first ever controlled powered flight? This happened on December the 17th, 1903, at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. What you see here is their famous machine, exactly as it was in 1903, except that the museum replaced all the fabric covering in 1985. It was controlled by wing warping, meaning twisting for roll control, a front elevator for pitch control, and a rudder for yaw control. The first ever system for basic three axis control, not unlike what exists on most aircrafts built since. It did not use weight shifting for in-flight control at all. In this picture, the unfortunately is off to the right and to the right of the propeller, but it could just make out the A-frames attached near the trailing edges of the upper and lower wing, which resist the side loads imposed by the rudder when it is used. Going to slide five now. In my view, it is very instructive to know what personality types the Wright brothers were and how they got that way, which was partly due to the sort of parents that they had. As Orville Wright said, we were lucky enough to grow up in an environment where there was always much encouragement to children to pursue intellectual interests, to investigate whatever they, whatever aroused curiosity. In a different kind of environment, our curiosity might have been nipped long before it could have borne fruit. In my view, th this makes an interesting contrast with what some of us have experienced, partly as children and partly as adults. Going to slide six now. From this description of them, Orville Wright was an impulsive and optimistic person, while his brother Orville was far more contemplative and thoughtful. Orville was curious and energetic and had a wide range of interests. He also had a quick mind, constantly coming up with new inventions. The Wright brothers also seemed to have had mutually complementary personalities, which allowed them to work together very well as a team. Going to slide seven now. Here's what they looked like around 1903, at the time when they made that first successful powered flight. They were two talented but modest bicycle shop owners who created a world-changing technology. Going to slide eight. This slide summarizes very well why the Wright brothers succeeded, where all previous attempts at controlled powered flight failed. The key thing here was their own designed wind tunnel. They used it to actually measure the lift and drag produced by small scale models of their proposed full size aircraft and used the test results directly in the design of the 1903 and a number of gliders which preceded it. Early, earlier experimenters had also used wind tunnels, but the Wright brothers found the data they obtained to be faulty. The Wright brothers were also the first to use their wind tunnel data directly using small scale models of their proposed full-sized aircraft prior to constructing and flying them. Slide number nine. This shows a model of the successful 1903 flyer on the left, 
compared at the same scale with the 1902 glider in the middle, which immediately preceded it. The model on the right represents the 1900 glider. The 1900 glider produced less wing lift than expected from the design data from early, earlier experimenters, which was all the Wright brothers had before they built their own wind tunnel. <clears throat> but the wing warping control method developed using a glider they built in 1899 worked well with the 1900 glider. The 1900 glider was also their first piloted one. The wind tunnel gave them the design data used in building their 1902 glider, which was successful in all respects. It produced the expected wing lift, its wing warping system worked well, and so did the canard wing used for pitch control. Going to slide 10 now. This shows a replica and photo of their 1900 glider. And as you can see, the photo of their 1900 glider shows it in flight. Going to slide 11. And here's a photo of their 1902 glider in flight. All of the above, leading to the 1903 Wright Flyer, had to happen before heavier than air machines could be used for anything, carrying passengers, mail, cargo, or as fighting machines in war. Proceeding to slide 12. This slide about the Curtis JN4 Jenny represents a first awakening to the hazard of airframe icing in flight, humorous in this case. I have not been able to find the details of the occasion when pilot Ernest M. Allison said this, or the exact date. The Jenny flew the first airmail in the US in 1918. Many Jennies were used for airmail in the US after World War I. Always considered it a very, self air, a very safe airplane because the carburetor would vibrate the airplane so badly that it would shake the ice off the wings. How about that? Going to slide 13 now. But the world's first official airmail delivery flight happened on February the 18th, 1911, when Frenchman Henri Pequet flew about 6,500 pieces of official mail from Allahabad to Naini in India, a distance of about five miles, that's eight kilometers. This item from the Smithsonian Postal Museum doesn't say anything about the aircraft shown in the photo. But balloons and gliders carried mail long before the Curtis JN4 Jenny or any other powered heavier than air flying machine. The history of airmail dates back to the first manned balloons of the 18th century. Among other things, President George Washington wrote the first letter flown in the United States. J.P. Blanchard carried the letter of introduction as he ascended in a balloon from Philadelphia's Walnut Street prison yard on January the 9th, 1793. The letter's location now is unknown. The first official US airmail delivery took place 66 years later on August the 17th, 1859. Speed and reliability improved considerably early in the 20th century. These and other flights happened during what they call the pioneer period in the United States, which culminated on November the 3rd, 1916, when a Victor Karlstrom completed a mail carrying flight from Chicago to New York. Post office officials then immediately started planning for regular scheduled air mail service. World War I then delayed everything. So schedule, scheduled air mail service only started on May the 15th, 1918. Going to slide 14 now. The world's first ever scheduled passenger flight happened on January the 1st, 1914, from St. Petersburg to Tampa in Florida, when Anthony Habersack Janus piloted a St. Petersburg-Tampa airboat line Benoist 
Type 14 flying boat carrying St. Petersburg, carrying St. Petersburg Mayor, Abraham C. File. The federal government then determined that pilots of commercial flights should be licensed. Janus then became the first ever federally licensed pilot. There are a few more items at the Udva Hazy Center on this same theme, and I'll deal with these later. Meanwhile, we found a few more exhibits of particular interest to us at the original downtown Washington, D.C. Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Going to slide 15 now. The first of these is the Ryan Nip aircraft named Spirit of St. Louis, in which Charles Lindbergh made the first ever solo non-stop Atlantic crossing in 1927 on May 20th to 21st. The former barnstormer and airmail pilot flew from New York to Paris in 33 and a half hours, a distance of about 3,610 miles. It's 5,800 kilometers. A crowd of about 150,000 people greeted him when he landed at Le Bourget Airport, just outside Paris. 16. Going now to a couple of newer items in the museum, some people may remember the Thiokol XLR-99 RM-1 Pioneer rocket engine, which powered the X-15 hypersonic research aircraft in the 50s and 60s. On its fastest flight, it reached Mark 6.7, and on another flight, it reached 354,200 feet. This is the only rocket engine ever to use anhydrous ammonia as the fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. At the time it was designed, many state-of-the-art large rocket engines used a 75-25 ethyl alcohol water mix for fuel and liquid oxygen for the oxidizer. A few of the reasons for choosing ammonia for the, as fuel for the X-15 and its Thiokol XLR-99 rocket engine were that it gave better performance than the ethyl alcohol water mix referred to, was more suitable for regenerative cooling than cheap kerosene, and was safer than the hydrazine fuel candidates, which had been tried in some test engines. I use this photo from the museum's website instead of taking my own, our own photo of it, because our cell phone ran out of battery power and we left the battery charger for it at the Airbnb where we were staying. Not very clever of me, was it? Uh -huh. Prior to the XLR-99 rocket engine, the only example I could find of ammonia's use as a fuel in any kind of heat engine happened during World War II from 1943 in Belgium as a fuel for motor buses mixed with coal gas to deal with severe shortages of diesel fuel. Going to slide 17 now. The second thing of particular interest to us was the General Electric J-58 turbo ramjet, which powered the Mark III SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. This engine was unique in having the bypass pipes system for bleeding off most of the air entering the compressor before reaching the combustion chamber and routing it directly to the afterburner. This was always used when cruising at Mach 3 plus during the photo reconnaissance missions, which the SR-71 was used for. Again, this photo was taken from the museum's website for the same reason as for the XLR-99 rocket engines. Going to slide 18. From here on, I'm going to talk about some of what we saw at the Udvar Hazy Center, located at Dulles International Airport. I'm going to start with a few items there concerning the early history of flight, including balloons, etc., as well as heavier than air flying machines. Some of these are in the form of old pictures of early balloon flights. The next, this slide and the next two show at a glance, the scope of most of the exhibits at the Udvar Hazy Center, except of course, for the old prints of balloon flights, etc. There's another part of it on slide 19. 
And here's the rest of it on, uh, on slide 20. Moving to slide 21 now. This old picture depicts the famous Montgolfier balloon flight of November 21st, 1783, which carried two passengers. The first free non-tethered human flight took place um, on this same flight. And the passenger was science, passengers were science teacher, Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier and Francois Laurent, who was the Marquis d'Arland at the time. The flight of this same Montgolfier balloon started from the grounds of the Chateau de la Muette in the western outskirts of Paris. They flew at about uh, 3,000 feet above Paris for a distance of about 5.6 miles, nine kilometers. After 25 minutes, the balloon landed outside the city ramparts on the Butte aux Cailles. This slide shows the approximate flight path. Going to slide 23. The actual landing spot is shown on current maps as La Jardin de la Montgolfière in the 13th arrondissement in Paris. On some recent trips, we had no prior knowledge of this, but we found the plaque referring to it quite by accident when we visited the freshwater spring there while staying at an apartment less than five minutes walk away from it. I-24. The Montgolfier balloon flight is just one of roughly a hundred items like this in the form of drawings and pictures at the Udva Hazy Center, but time precludes describing more of them. So we're going to cover just two more items there about early flying that happened before the Wright brothers or soon after them. The first of these is the Langley Aerodrome A, which is what you see here on slide 24, slide 25. To get airborne, this piloted machine was launched by a rail and catapult system off the top of a houseboat, but this proved disastrous on two attempts in 1903 with the second attempt just days before the Wright brothers' flyer success. Samuel Langley's design was simplistic and mechanically unsound, even though it was based on some unpiloted models which flew successfully in 1896. Going to slide 26. Samuel Langley's approach proved to be a grave error. He focused primarily on the power plant. The completed engine, a water-cooled five-cylinder radial, was considered at the time to be a great achievement. The Aerodrome A crashed on takeoff on October the 7th, 1903, and again on December the 8th, just nine days before the Wright brothers successfully flew their flyer for the first time. Langley blamed the launch mechanism for the two crashes, and the second crash ended Langley's aeronautical work. Going to slide 27. The second of these uh, interesting items is the Farman Sport from France. This is one example of the kinds of successful and practical aeroplanes, other than military, which began to appear after World War I. It could not be called a passenger aircraft because it could carry just one person in addition to the pilot. And it's described as a, quote, two-place sport and light commercial airplane. In 1922, C.D. Ludington and Wallace Kellett formed the Ludington Exhibition Company as U.S. agents for farm and aircraft. The next year, they imported their first two sports. Their pilot flew this aircraft, serial number 15, in the 1924 on to Dayton race, which included flying over the treacherous Allegheny Mountains. After suffering severe damage in 1928, it had its airworthiness certificate revoked. It was restored by Ken Hyde of Warrington, Virginia, after years in storage in Pennsylvania, New Jersey. C.D. Ludington himself identified the aircraft, allowing Mr. Hyde 
to reclaim its original NC-72 designation. This aircraft is the last surviving Farman Sport. Slide 28. At this point, I thought it appropriate to continue for a while with some more powered sporting and light aircraft, followed by some with no engine, meaning sailplanes, motor gliders, hang gliders, and the like. The first of these is the Booker Jungmeister. This was introduced in Germany in 1935 and was a single seat variant of a two seat advanced aerobatic trainer. See you next slide. Going to 29. This aircraft type dominated the aerobatic scene in Europe and the US from the mid 1930s through the 1940s. Romanian pilot Alex Papana brought this particular Jungmeister to the US in a crate in the Hindenburg airship and flew it at the 1937 Cleveland air races. And of course, you all know what happened to the Hindenburg, don't you? <laughs> a later owner, Beverly Bevo Howard, won the 1946 and 1947 American Aerobatic Championships in it. Unfortunately, Howard was killed in an accident with this aircraft in 1971, but his estate restored the Jungmeister and donated it to the Smithsonian in 1973. 30. This aeroplane, the Monocoupe 110, was a contemporary of the Jungmeister for some years after the former's introduction. It was another specialized aircraft for aerobatic competition use. See the next slide. 31. Airshow pilot and aerobatic champion W.W. W. Woody Edmondson named this aircraft Little Butch for its bulldog-like appearance and placed second to Bevo Howard in the 1946 and 1947 American Aerobatic Championships. But subsequently, he won first place in the International Aerobatic Championships with it in 1948. A later owner of Little Butch, Ken Hyde of Warrington in Virginia, restored Little Butch after years in storage before donating it to the Smithsonian. I-32. The North American P-51 Mustang Excalibur III was a modified Second World War P-51C Mustang. This represents another breed of sporting popular in the US for many years now, in this case for air racing. This particular aircraft and its owner pilot also did something very special in terms of navigation. On May the 29th, 1951, Captain Charles F. Blair flew Excalibur III from Norway to Alaska across the North Pole in a record setting 10 and a half hours. For navigation, he de developed a special set of sun lines in order to overcome the problems caused by magnetic compasses often failing when flying over or close to the Earth's magnetic poles, north or south. An earlier owner of this aircraft, Paul A. Mance, fitted this aircraft with extra fuel tanks for long distance air racing. With it, he won the 1946 and 1947 Bendix Air Race and set a transcontinental speed record in 1947 and named this aircraft Blaze of Noon. Charles F. Blair purchased this aircraft in 1949 and renamed it Excalibur III after the VS-44 flying boat he used to fly for American Export Airlines. Next, 34. This was once the smallest, the world's smallest piloted aircraft, the Sitz, Stitz, SA 2A Sky Baby. It had a wingspan of just 2.2 meters and a length of three meters. It was designed and built in 1952 by Ray Stitz at his home and remained the world's smallest aircraft into the 1980s. Number 35. This is the Monet Moni. 
It was designed by a school teacher, John Monette, in the early 1980s and is a, quote, motor glider, unquote, with constant cord wings for ease of construction by home builders and had a V tail. He called it an air recreation vehicle. I found that this same John Monette had also designed and built a glider called the Monterey, also for home builders of aircraft, also with constant cord wings and a V tail. When I found this, I was researching possible home build glider designs to build myself in Ottawa and had no prior knowledge of the Monet Money before going to Washington. The Monterey glider had been involved in a number of accidents at Sugarbush Airport near Warren, Vermont, and acquired a reputation there which was dangerous enough for that airport to ban it from flying sometime in the 1990s. There was an amusing incident in 1995 when a brave Monterey pilot, Dave Nadler, decided to demonstrate that it was in fact safe to fly, given proper attention to the glider's center of gravity with the aid of ballast installed before flying it. To get this right, he decided to put 20 pounds of ballast in his trouser pockets before flying and satisfied himself that his harness would make everything secure when he sat in, in the cockpit and tightened his straps. There was no ballast mounting posts in this particular glider and other monorays. So I had to do that. Anyway, thanks to the ballast in his trouser pockets, he had a safe aerotow, followed by a safe and uneventful flight to Sugarbush Airport, where on landing safely, he was greeted by a group of glider pilots and others with loud applause. Then his pants fell down when he stood up to get out of the glider in front of the laughing and clapping array of glider pilots. How about that for a happy ending? Slide 36. These two photos just show just a few of the many sailplanes, hang gliders, etc., on display at the Udvahazy Center. 37. One of the more interesting sailplanes is this one called the Nomad designed by Robert M. Stanley, and he finished constructing it in June 1938. He designed it between 1935 and 1938 while serving in the US Navy, building it in the basement of a house that he shared with other sailors in San Diego, California. It was the world's first sailplane with a V tail. Originally, when first completed, it had a conventional horizontal tailplane and and vertical fin, but following a competition flight later that year, ending with a landing in a field, some souvenir hunter removed and stole the tailplane and fin while Mr. Stanley was phoning to reach his retrieve crew. Later, Mr. Stanley designed and built the V-tail to replace the stolen tailplane and fin on the grounds that his new V-tail was smaller, lighter, and created less drag. How about that one? Number 38. The white-tailed V tail, I'm sorry, the white V-tailed Sisu 1A with the number 33 under a wing was the world's first sailplane to fly more than thousand a thousand kilometers non-stop. This was in 1964, the pilot being Alvin H. Parker. 39. In 2002, Pete Lehman, flying this Will's Wing Talon 150 hang glider, set a world distance hang record for hang gliders of 516, flying from Zapata in southern Lex Texas, though that record has since been broken. Again, starting from Zapata. From here on, I'm going to deal with a few of the many World War II military aircraft on display. One might say that the best known of these are the B-29s, which dropped the two atomic bombs on Japan to end World War II. The first, the gun-type uranium bomb called Little Boy, was dropped by the Enola Gay on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, followed by the implosion-type plutonium bomb called Fat Man 
dropped on Nagasaki by boxcar on August the 9th of that year, three days later. What you see here is the Enola Gay. This is just one of the many large exhibits at Udva Hazy, which are impossible to fit into a single picture without special equipment for positioning a camera at the optimum vantage point. This was the best I could do. Going to slide 41. I'm sure everybody will recognize the P-47 Thunderbolt. Among other World War II aircraft at the Udva Hazy Center are a Hawker Hurricane 2C, a Fokker Wolf 190F, and a Grumman F6F3 Hellcat. But I really think these aircraft are already so well known to aviation history fans as to need no further introduction from me. That's why I've put all four of these on the same slide. But I can provide more information about all of them later on for people interested in these particular aircraft which are on display. 42. This lesser known beast is a Heimkull 219A2 Uhu, meaning eagle owl in English. This particular example was built in 1944, the only surviving one of its type. And this example had two 30 millimeter cannons plus four 20 millimeter cannons. It was a night fighter guided to its target by radar and another one shot down five British bombers on its first mission in 1943. Forty-three. I'm sure everyone will recognize the Messerschmitt 163 Comet and its Walter HWK 109-509A1 rocket motor, shown at the bottom of the picture. It used hydrogen peroxide for the oxidizer and a hydrazine hydrate and methanol mixture for fuel. Some hydrogen peroxide was decomposed into steam and oxygen to drive the turbo pump, forcing the propellants into the rocket combustion chamber. A full fuel load permitted only eight to 10 minutes of powered flight. Slide 44. This is the Arado 234 Blitz. It was the world's first operational jet bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. It had two Junkers Jumo 004B1 axial flow turbojets similar to those used in the Messerschmitt 262, which everybody knows about, plus two Walter liquid fuel rocket motors. Its first reconnaissance mission was over the Normandy beachhead on August the 2nd, 1944, following D-Day on June the 6th of that year. The two rocket motors were exclusively for assisting takeoff and were dropped off by parachute after fuel burnout for recovery and reuse. Its speed and altitude when on reconnaissance missions enabled it to easily elude all allied fighter aircraft, it had a top speed of 735 kilometers per hour. Number 45. This is the Dornier 335 file. I believe few people will have heard of this one. It was unique in World War II in having an engine at the rear with a pusher propeller plus a similar engine with a tractor propeller in the nose. This arrangement meant less drag and better maneuverability relative to anything else previously tried. One of the fastest piston engine aircraft ever built, it first flew in September 1943 and had a top speed of 763 kilometers per hour. World War II ended before any mass production could start. Fighter, trainer, and night fighter versions were planned. This particular example is the sole surviving one. This is the Nakajima Kicker fighter and its uh, NE-20 engine, of which it had two. The first prototype flew successfully once, but crashed on its second flight. I doubt many people will remember this one either, unlike its superficially similar contemporary the German Messerschmitt 262, which was bigger and had Jumo 004B engines with nearly twice the thrust of the NE-20 engines in the Nakajima Kika. This particular example 
was a structural test set specimen and the engine nacelles on it were too small for the indigenous NE20 engines. Of course, this example also never flew. The NE20 engine was based on the German BMW 003, and this was made possible by Imperial Japanese Navy engineer Aichi Iwaya, obtaining photographs and a simple cutaway drawing of the German BMW 003. The German BMW 03 in turn was developed mainly for the Heinkel 162 Volkswagen fighter, built mainly of wood and one of Germany's last ditch projects near the end of World War II. Number 47. This is the Horton H03H flying wing glider, swept wings. The Horton 3 is just one of many experimental swept flying wing gliders designed and built by the Horton brothers before and during World War II. Their experience with swept flying wings led ultimately to the Horton 225, sorry, 229 high speed light jet bomber project powered by two Jumo 004B engines in Nazi Germany, resulting from a 1943 request from Hermann Göring, who was then head of the Luftwaffe. The Horton 229 made a successful maiden flight in December 1944. This was followed by two further test flights on the 2nd of February 1945 and on February the 18th, 1945. But then it was, then it was destroyed in a fatal crash on that third test flight which killed its pilot. Number 48. This is the Northrop N1M flying wing. Sorry about the clipped wings in one of the pictures, but this was yet another case of it being impossible to access a good vantage point for a good all-inclusive photo. It was designed by Jack Northrop and first flew on July the 3rd, 1941. It's jet, it's Powered successors included the, the piston engined Northrop XB 35, the Northrop XB 49 experimental four jet bomber, and ultimately the B 2 stealth bomber. Now we move on from slide 49 to some exclusively post World War II things. The first of these is the Bell X 1 rocket powered transonic and supersonic research aircraft. This particular example, named Glamorous Glenis by test pilot Chuck Yeager after his first wife, was the first ever manned aircraft to bake the sound barrier, which it first did on October the 10th, 1947, when it reached Mark 1.06 at a height of 13,000 meters. Number 50. Here are three aircraft types from the Korean War of 1950 to 53. A MiG-15 BIS in North Korean markings, a Lockheed T-33A shooting star, and a North American F-86A Sabre. I think these aircraft need little or no introduction from me, but as in previous cases like this, I can provide more information. I can provide more information about these particular examples later on for people who are interested. Here are five aircraft types from the Vietnam War. A McDonnell Douglas F4S Phantom II, a Grumman A6E Intruder, a MiG-21F, North American F-100D Super Sabre, and a Republic F-105D Thunder Chief. Again, in my view, these are already known and so need little introduction from me. Though as before, I have further information about all of them. Before I close, we saw a few more interesting things. The first of these is the X-35 STOVL Joint Strike Fighter and its propulsion system. This slide represents my own rather bad attempt to remove, remove most of the background clutter in the picture very difficult to do at all, caused by the presence of other aircraft exhibits very close by, 
which make the original picture very confusing to anybody not aware of this aircraft's actual physical appearance. Just one more result of the problems referred to earlier about suitable vantage points for good, all-inclusive pictures. This next slide, 53, represents the overall configuration of the X-35B propulsion system. The main engine at the left of the picture is at the rear end of the fuselage. The other part of the system, the lift fan near the front of the aircraft, but behind the cockpit, is physically completely separate from the main engine. In the aircraft, the two are connected by a long draft, which is not shown in the exhibit. The lift fan just provides vertical lift only during takeoffs and landings and is never used for providing any forward thrust in normal wing-borne flight. This means that the lift fan requires far less horsepower and fuel consumption rate to produce the same lift force to lift the front of the aircraft. The reason is that this configuration allows the use of a relatively large diameter fan passing a large air mass flow rate at low velocity relative to what is possible with the Pegasus engines and its rotating exhaust nozzles. <clears throat> In the Pegasus engine, the relatively small rotating engine exhaust nozzles are used both for vertical lift and for normal wing borne forward flight. They are all small mass flow rate and high velocity nozzles. Pegasus engine variants were used in all the versions of the well-known Harrier, <coughs> both in the UK and the US. Slide number 54. This is the Boeing 307 Stratoliner called Clipper Flying Cloud. I took the top picture myself in the Udva Hazy Center. The bottom one is from Wikipedia. First flown in late 1938. The Boeing 307 was the first airline with a pressurized fuselage. It could carry 33 passengers in great comfort and cruise at 6,096 meters, that's 20,000 feet, while maintaining a cabin pressure of 2,438 meters, that's 8,000 feet. This enabled the Stratoliner to fly above most bad weather, thereby providing a faster and smoother ride. Now the slide 30. 55. This is the first prototype Boeing 707. Called the Boeing 707-80, it first flew on July the 15th, 1954, at Seattle's 1955 Sea Fair and Gold Cup hydroplane races held on Lake Washington on August the 6th, 1955. To everybody's surprise, Boeing test pilot Alvin Tex Johnson performed a barrel roll to show off the jet airliner. It had been expected to simply make a single flyover, nothing else. The next day, Bill Allen, president of Boeing from 1945 to 1968, summoned Tex Johnson to his office and told him not to perform such a maneuver again. Johnson's assertion was that doing so is completely safe. 956. Concord. This particular aircraft, FBVFA, made its last ever flight to Washington Dulles International Airport on June the 12th, 2003, and was the oldest of the Air France supersonic fleet. It had just flown from Paris to be donated to the Smithsonian Institution. 57. This is the SR-71A Blackbird. Getting any pictures at all of this aircraft other than the one shown, was impossible without it being largely hidden amongst background clutter. As things are, in the picture shown, the back end of the aircraft was completely hidden under the walkway shown in the foreground, and the rest of the picture gives a quite misleading impression of its true physical shape. By the time of its last flight, on March 6, 1990, this particular example had flown about 2,800 hours over 24 years of active service. And on that last flight, piloted by Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Ed Yielding and Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Vida, 
It set a new speed record of 3,418 kilometers per hour when flying from Los Angeles to Dulles International Airport near Washington, DC. On landing that day, it was donated to the Smithsonian Institution. Number 58. The previous slide concludes our presentation of the things which we found the most interesting from an aviation history perspective, involving, from our standpoint, heavier than air machines supported in flight by wings. There is much else at this museum concerning rockets and space flight, and usually unpiloted weapons of war, which flew within the atmosphere or outside it. But in general, we felt these lay outside the scope of what we were trying to do, quite apart from the time factor. Some of these weapons of war were and are launched from aircraft. So we're going to finish with just two more items. First, the space shuttle, which is part spacecraft and part aircraft. And finally, a view of the restoration workshop at the Obvahese Center. What you see on this slide is space shuttle discovery. Number 59, discovery retired as the longest serving and most accomplished space shuttle orbiter. It flew on 39 Earth orbital missions and spent a total of 365 days in space. Over these 35, 39 missions, it flew a total of 251 crew members consisting of 184 different men and women, many of whom flew more than once. Discovery retired as the longest serving and most accomplished space shuttle orbiter. It flew every type of mission that the space shuttle was designed to fly. So it embodies the entire history of US space flight from the first flight ever, first space shuttle flight ever in 1981, all the way to 2011. It last flew in 2011 on the 133rd space shuttle mission. Lastly, here are two views of the Mary Engen Restoration Center at the Obvahese Center. The left-hand picture shows a German V2 rocket then in pieces with a floor area of 48,000 square feet. The hangar will accommodate several aircraft to be worked upon all at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your patience. I will now answer as best any questions as I can, any questions which you might have. 